Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Kent. I'm the Director of Education for the National Atomic Testing Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, here at the National Atomic Testing Museum for today's distinguished lecture. We're thrilled to be hosting the National everyone. Nuclear Security Administration's Jay Tilden for this special webinar. But before we get started, I do want to make mention that the museum will be closed to the public until January 2nd for a holiday break and COVID-19 safety precaution. Please note that we will be taking questions from Mr. Tilden after his talk and we'll be pulling them from the Zoom chat box. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jay Tilden. Since 2016, Mr. Tilden has served as the NNSA's Associate Administrator for Counterterrorism and Counterproliferation counter with responsibility in preparing for, responding to, and successfully resolving nuclear and radiological accidents and incidents worldwide. From 2009 to 2012, Mr. Tilden served as the director of the Office of Nuclear Threat Science, leading an integrated technical staff of federal, contractor, and national laboratory, laboratory personnel that executed the multi-laboratory nuclear counterterrorism program, charged with the evaluation of a wide range of nuclear threat devices, including improvised nuclear device concepts and designs. Mr. Tilden is a retired Army Chief Warrant Officer and served in both active and reserve capacities, including the Desert Shield Desert Storm and Enduring Freedom Noble Eagle operations. He graduated from the University of Maryland in 1990 and completed postgraduate studies in strategic intelligence from DIA's Joint Military Intelligence College in 1999. Once again, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jay Tilden. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks Joe for the intro and I really appreciate the uh, National Atomic Testing Museum sponsoring this and hopefully you'll find it of some value. Um, you know, I will say right now, I hope this is more fun than it sounds because anytime I hear the words distinguished, it usually means old and stodgy and somewhat formal. And then lecture means someone did something like running in the hallway of scissors. So I'm hoping it won't be that. Lastly, the Army Navy game is ongoing right now. So I hope I hope you got to see some of that where Army, of course, will beat Navy. Uh, so my goal is about 25 minutes of a talk up front and then question and answers and then we'll wrap it up and I'll grab a scotch and watch the game. Let's start, let's start uh, we're going to start broad, then we're going to go into the history piece and then we're going to come back out. So broadly, you know, I think most of you know what the mission of the NNSA is, but I'll refresh you all if you don't. Uh, our primary mission is, in fact, as you know, we're a derivative agency of, of what was once the Atomic Energy Commission. And our primary mission really is the maintenance of America's strategic nuclear deterrent. Uh, the next piece is, of course, global threat reduction, global nuclear security, and nonproliferation. That's where my office sits in that larger, in that larger grouping of mission areas. And then lastly, naval reactors, which is a joint Navy and NNSA piece that provides the Navy with its nuclear propulsion systems. I head up a small office uh, uh, that is really kind of a niche mission, which as you already heard in the intro, it really is about um, being prepared for the unexpected relative to nuclear things. One of our underpinning offices, nuclear threat science, which is one that I headed up uh, probably a billion years ago, uh, it was all about understanding nuclear devices, nuclear threat devices. So someone loses control of a nuclear weapon, what could a bad guy adversary do with it? Um, if the weapon, uh, or if someone uh, manages to get nuclear material, so let's say a substate actor, terrorists get, get nuclear or even radiological material, but we primarily worry about nuclear material. What could they do, uh, what could they do with it? Um, and from that studies of these, um, these uh, weapons and or devices that were not being used as designed, um, that, that actually helps us across a whole range of things. We help to inform the U.S. government on nuclear material security strategies, many of which are actually uh, imported into the international standards to the IAEA. We also um, help uh, to frame prioritization. If our DNN colleagues, defense nuclear and nonproliferation colleagues, are looking across the world and they have 15 million million dollars to spend in a given year uh, to remove materials that may be at risk. We can actually help them uh, look at it from a, uh, from a threat attractiveness standpoint and give them advice about which materials should be removed. We also, of course, feed all of this into, um, into policies. 
policies that are relating to uh, nuclear incident response. Um, so we actually helped to train both the FBI, who's the domestic um, EOD response partners, emergency, uh, sorry, uh, emergency ordinance disposal folks, uh, as well as the, o, um, the um, OCONUS, the outside the continental US, the DOD mission force. We help to train them and we actually go, uh, we actually go with them, depending on the case, as well as provide reach back to our national labs, where our expertise about uh, the accident cases and the kinds of insults that a device or an improvised nuclear device um, might be able to, uh, to handle um, without going off. Because again, oftentimes our mission here is to prevent unauthorized nuclear detonation. So that's kind of the range of things that we do. Uh, we also do some forensics work, but I'll talk about that later in the end. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the site, but larger than that. I think a lot of you who are online right now probably know more about the site than I do. Uh, but what I think is important is that sometimes we do get myopic. Uh, we look at the site, we look at any given governmental facility, and we look at it in, 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 in these different spheres. Like, what are we doing on site? One is how do we get along with our, our bosses in DC? But then lastly, some of the things we have to remember is actually what's going on at these given locations are being driven by international events. And so I feel we should maybe discuss a little bit of that. And now some of this, and especially if we get into Q&A and you're asking about where we're going, that will be my opinion. This is not gonna be an administration statement. Obviously we're in the middle of transition, um, but I will try to be as candid as I can with my professional judgment about where we're heading. Um, some of you on the phone, like I said, are going to be more expert on this. So I'm really glad that the, uh, the microphones are muted. That way, some of the guffawing and laughing won't come out. Uh, also, I believe one of our listeners on there, a good colleague and friend, Jim uh, McDonnell, uh, he's with MSTS out at the site right now, uh, and recently of DHS, is having his birthday. I think it's like his 146th or something birthday. And, and he's Navy, but we still, you know, we still get along. So anyway, happy birthday, Jim. So let's go on and start a little bit with the discussion about, quote unquote, the boom, time, boom times. And I apologize, I'm going to read this because, uh, you know, there's, it's a lot for me just to go free form. So I want to make sure that I do it a little bit of justice here. So as we know, President Truman designated the 680 square mile site as the Atomic Energy Commission Nevada Proving Grounds in 1950. And then less than two months later was the first atmospheric test at that site. Uh, it was ABLE in January of 51 at the, again, the Nevada Proving Grounds. That atmospheric test was the first of 100 such atmospheric tests at the site, followed by some 828 underground tests that, were, uh, that would end up being at what we call NTS. And you'll hear me call it the site throughout most of this because of the changes in nomenclature. To me, at least, the site has been and will likely remain synonymous with the US strategic deterrent and the Cold War. Some of our most iconic Cold War imagery comes from events that happened at, at, at NTS, at the site, when testing was conducted there. But why in December of 1950 did MPG, later NTS, I think as we many of us knew at NTS, come to life? And why the rush to the ABLE test, the fifth such test in the atomic, in the atomic age? I'm gonna take off my, uh, my elf hat because I realize it is starting to get a little warm. Well, in 1950 was a pretty tumultuous year. In fact, just before that, in August of 1949, the Soviet Union de uh, detonated its first atomic bomb in an atmospheric uh, test at Semipalatinsk, so kind of their answer to NTS. And it was a test they did not announce. We detected it via a, um, a plane that has sniffers on it, um, and we are the ones who announced it to the world. And that, of course, sent shocks into all of the national security uh, circles. Uh, in January of 1950, Secretary of State Dean Acheson had publicly announced how the U.S. defined its defensive perimeter in Asia, addressing both the dual communist China and Soviet threats in the Pacific, and it omitted South Korea. And as most of you know, uh, that was seen by North Korea as a signal that the peninsula was kind of off limits as our red lines, and later in June, the Korean War started. Also in January, Klaus Fuchs admitted to spying and passing nuclear secrets to the Russians. So this is right after they, they, they set off their device, like five months before. In February, a B-36 convoy 
nuclear bomb with a nuclear bomb on board, no, no nuclear core, um, crashed off the coast of Vancouver, British uh, Columbia. So that is in fact the first broken arrow. And I think as you heard me mention earlier, one of the things we do is respond to these kinds of incidents. So uh, my office uh, within it, there's the Office of Nuclear Incident Response owns what we call the Accident Response Group, which are the folks that go with the DOD to respond to any broken arrow. So that was our first broken arrow. In April, a B-29 bomber crashed into a mountain at Monzano Air Base, now known as Kirkland Sandia. And the nuclear bomb did not have the core inserted, but the nuclear core was on board. On July 13th, a B-50 bomber crashed near Lebanon, Ohio with a nuclear bomb, no core on board. On July 13th, a B-50 bomber crashed near Lebanon, oh, I already read that, sorry. In August of, of um, uh, of the same year, a B-29 bomber, one of the uh, 10 nuclear capable bombers being deployed to Guam to deter Chinese aggression against Taiwan and South Korea. So again, some themes here that were back in the 50s that are still here today, crashed with a nuclear bomb, uh, but there was no core on board. Interestingly, an Air Force general was also aboard and died as a result of that crash. The air base was later named after him, Travis Air Force Base. Also in August, President Truman, recognizing the full contour of the Cold War facing the nation, issued NSC 68. It was a presidential directive shifting from containment, which was being uh, espoused earlier by Kennan and company as we just got to hold back the line, to actually confrontation and rollback of communism. This directive became our roadmap during the Cold War and dramatically increased defense spending. Part of that dispense spending was not only made at the site, making the site a reality, but it also authorized the full development of the hydrogen bomb. Lastly, in November, a US B-50 bomber would drop its nuclear payload during an emergency without a plutonium core over the St. Lawrence River near Quebec in December. So I know I put a spin of 19... 50 in largely nuke flavor, but that's the point here. 1950 was really a year of turmoil for national security. So that's why you see now the site and that's how it was born. So from 1951 until September of 1992, NTS or NNSS as we call it today, uh, and again, I'm gonna keep calling it the site, was a product of urgent and national level security concerns from the highest offices. The site was a hub of activity with personnel from across the nuclear weapon complex. The national laboratories and the plant personnel all working closely with site technicians and engineers to test both current and new device designs uh, of the stockpile. The site served the nation, sustained an advanced strategic deterrent, but it was not actually early on. The nation asked for sacrifices from our military, the atomic veterans, and even some of our own citizen neighbors, the downwinders. Understanding the national imperatives of the time, it was a race against an enemy that was seemingly ahead of us, the Iron Curtain that had dropped across Europe and a war raging on the Korean Peninsula were critical to understanding why some of these choices were made. Now I'm gonna fast forward because I think we all know what was going on at the site, right? But that's kind of the, the genus. Um, the, and then in September, 1992, something happens, right? And that was the termination of underground testing. And so again, I think we ought to talk a little bit about how did the site start the way it did? Well, how did it suddenly get to this termination point, at least for testing? And how we arrived there was really not abrupt, but it was much faster than anyone expected. It started in August of 1987 with an unprecedented display of transparency called the Joint Verification Experiment at NTS, where Soviet and US technicians jointly tested detection limits of underground testing. So that was the beginning of the perestroika and the glasnost and this, this thawing of the relationship uh, between Gorbachev and uh, Reagan. And that was a real physical manifestation at your site right there in Nevada. Then cascading events began to speed up follow, uh, and followed. In 1989, with Gorbachev's rejection of the Brezhnev policy, uh, which was the use of force to sustain the Warsaw Pact and communist aligned countries, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the departure of East Germany from the Warsaw Pact, and then the peaceful dissolution of the USSR in December of 1991.
by the way, just to be clear, many of these things continue to echo, right? If you hear Putin, he will say that was probably the worst thing that could have ever happened to Russia was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. By January of 1992, the US and Russia agreed to detarget de major cities in both countries. And in February, both presidents uh, Bush and Yeltsin declared that the Cold War was over. But the collapse of the Warsaw Pact was not always peaceful. As we know, sadly, uh, Yugoslavia slid into a rather, rather bloody civil war. The Nagoro Karabakh region uh, became a battleground between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and that is one that we continue to see in the news just this week. Uh, and the pro, uh, pro Russian Crimea attempted to, to secede from the newly established state of the Ukraine. Um, so again, the thing that happened here under Putin, which was, of course, a very bold and very illegal move, can, had historic basis on the fact that there were Russians who wanted, didn't want to even be part of Ukraine when this all started. And then in September, on September 23rd, 1992, Divider became the last yield producing underground test at the site. So that is a pretty major moment. So now I think we go into from the boom times and then the end of the Cold War to what I call the hiatus and the transformation. So for a bit of time, say from 92 to maybe 2005, and we could all quibble about what those years were, the national security imperatives that had driven the site seemed to fade. While defense programs developed what would later be hailed as groundbreaking and transformative, the science-based stockpile storage program, or SBSS, the site as a priority for testing was somewhat put in a warm standby. While numerous national security missions continued to be executed, the driving denominator of nuclear testing was really missing. It was basically relegated to be, be ready to provide the test within X amount of years. Um, these decisions, the freezing of the stockpile size, no new nuclear weapon design, uh, um, and reliance as a substitute for explosive in the foundations of the site. It also began a multi-decade challenge in prioritizing and, and sustaining critical infrastructure for the site. If you aren't doing broad testing, then you have to figure out what's the pieces that you want to preserve, especially if you're in a hot standby for several years. But like the phoenix that arises from the ashes, uh, the NTS, the site, began its rebirth and its reshaping of missions. A major cornerstone of SBSS, of, of science-based stockpile stewardship, was the tremendous computational advances in modeling using historical test data to predict the behaviors in aging weapons. Dr. Vic Reese, who was then head of the nuclear weapons program at DOE, this is pre-NNSA days, also understood that both hydrodynamic and subcritical experiments were, were absolutely vital and critical to the success of any long-term testing freeze. So SBSS not only maintained certain experimental facilities across the nuclear weapons complex, but also drove new ones. So the National Ignition Facility at, uh, at Lawrence Livermore and the Dual Access Radiography Hydrodynamic Test Facility at Los Alamos and the overhaul and enhancement of the Z machine at Sandia in the mid nineties were all these things that were vitally needed to be able to do what we're doing to this day. So science-based stockpile stewardship embraced a new era of material sciences, including high energy density physics and inertial confinement fusion, which would advance our understanding of materials, unlike any under underground test would. The underground test, some people don't realize that underground testing, at least at the times that we did it, was pretty limited on what we were determining was success or failure. And we would occasionally have anomalies and oftentimes those anomalies could not be, uh, could not be determined. We couldn't figure out what it was just based on the testing data. What we could say is, hey, it, it went and we got the yield, but there were some things here going on. Interestingly, the science-based side of this and the computational combined with experimental have actually solved many of those things that were previously unknown. At NNSS, at the site, responding to the complex's need of experimental data, new capabilities sprung to life, such as JASPER, which is a ground, was a groundbreaking gas gun approved for plutonium, as well as the UNA complex for subcritical and hydrodynamic testing. These amazing capabilities and novel experimental facilities, known, as, uh, known colloquially by some as Reese's pieces, because they were kind of sprinkled about across the complex, 
were largely a result of Dr. Reese's vision of sustaining the nuclear deterrent through science, not through underground testing. So while the weapons program and to reshape the face of the strategic deterrent and attacks would also leave an imprint on the nature of the site. NTS and the surrounding federal lands were chosen due to geography and geology. The US government could develop and experiment new technologies and techniques far from prying eyes of the media, interested onlookers, or agents of foreign powers. This remains a critical and defining factor of the site to this day. It remains one of the few national security proving grounds of the nation. Although the US government has been was, had been concerned about nuclear terrorism for decades, and especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, 9-11 made the specter of nuclear terrorism even more frightening. Through the 90s, reports of lost, or, uh, lost stolen, or sold Russian nuclear material uh, seemingly lacked a buyer, save Iran, who was dabbling, who was at that time dabbling with a still secret nuclear program. Al Qaeda and its seem, uh, Al Qaeda and its seemingly centralized leadership was not only audacious enough to attack a U.S. ship of war and two embassies, but also around that time took time to get a legal fatwa, a finding, if you will, that would allow the use of a nuclear weapon or a weapon of mass destruction against against innocents, against citizens of other countries, if those countries were apostate uh, and those citizens were not uh, Muslim. Um, it, and that really was a thing that people looked at and said, okay, maybe this person's serious. If he's actually, uh, if uh, uh, Osama bin Laden is actually taking the time to develop a religious construct for the use of a weapon of mass destruction, we ought to pay attention to that. So bin Laden's, uh, inf at that time now, infamous fireside discussion with a member of Pakistani's nuclear program sent alarm bells sounding throughout Western capitals and certainly here in DC. DOE and now what it would be known as NNSA partnered with our law enforcement, intelligence community and military mission partners to develop technologies um, to, to aid, uh, sorry, to develop technologies and tactics to detect, disrupt and defeat any nuclear terrorism threat. And that is a lot, that's a, that's a, broad, that's a broad portfolio that we can certainly get into if we want to. These efforts included expansion in the late 1990s of cooperative efforts with the former Soviet Union uh, and those states to secure or remove nuclear materials, as well as new methods to detect and identify nuclear materials that may be outside of state control. The 2000s also brought challenges from Iran and North Korea regarding the nature of their nuclear programs. The site provided vital and one of a kind geography and infrastructure to aid government agencies in their technology development to detect proliferation signatures and to understand nation state weapons programs, as well as options on how to counter them. We also redoubled our efforts to improve our nation's nuclear explosive ordnance disposal techniques to be prepared to defeat both radiological and nuclear devices that we may face. In the 2000s, we began a close exchange with our French and UK counterparts on nuclear terrorism threats. Um, and we focused on a commonality area of detection, diagnostics, and assessment, as well as interactions between our nation's operational and scientific counterterrorism assets and personnel. And we were focused on these types of threat devices. By 2009, our close interactions with the UK and France led us to host a blind test of a nuclear training aid real nuclear material, mock explosives, but in a threat configuration inside the device assembly facility for each of the country's teams in succession to go after that device and diagnose it and then grade ourselves. Think about that. The DAF, which was a device conceived to be at the center of America's strategic deterrent and yet fundamentally denied its purpose of assembling devices for underground testing because of the end of testing being adapted to such a new mission. UK and French technical teams and their senior leaders to view such a blind challenge deep in the heart of such a secure facility. The groundbreaking exercise known as Fall Classic 
led to what is now well over a decade of continued technical exchanges and threat device blind challenges with the location of such exercises rotating among the P3. During the same period and continuing today, across the site, DOE and NNSA field office, national laboratory experts, experimentalists, along with our partners in NNSA's Office of Defense and Nonproliferation, departments, the Department of Homeland Security, and other interagency entities continue a myriad of test beds, technology development sites, and training locations to meet the treaty verification, homeland security, and counterproliferation missions. Not only are Jasper and UNA continuing to advance our understanding of key material sciences to support our stockpile, but the site continues to provide key platforms and geologic test beds to advance our ability to detect underground nuclear tests in violation of international norms and treaties. We continue to advance technologies that can identify critical infrastructure indicators of an illicit nuclear weapons program, as well as systems to detect special nuclear material in transit and potentially outside of, of regulatory control. The site continues to face challenges with aspects of the sprawling infrastructure and the needed repairs and improvements to that infrastructure. But those challenges are known and, prior, and they are now prioritized and improvements are being executed and we continue to debate in the future of the size of the budget that is needed to try to catch up with that. Now I'd like to point to a few specific activities that my little office does here at the site, uh, along with our friends at the Nevada Field Office, MSTS and the National Lab and Plant Partners. So right now today, we rely upon experts, uh, the experts and the facilities at the Nevada National Security Site, as well as at the Special Technologies Laboratory and the Remote Sensing Laboratories on Nellis Air Force Base and here in DC at jo Joint Base Andrews to execute our worldwide mission of nuclear emergency preparedness and response. We're just shy of $40 million at the, at the site and its dedicated professionals provide assets for our public health and safety program, which includes our ability to search for nuclear or radiological materials, including in threat type configurations. They're also members of our radiological assistance program, as well as the foundation of our consequence management program, including cons the consequence management home team that would stand up out there at the site and the aerial measuring system, which are fixed and rotary wing aircraft on call, both at Nellis and in uh, Joint Base Andrews, in case of an uncontrolled release of radiological material that could threaten the public health and safety or the environment. MSTS professionals supporting our ongoing capability assurance program, uh, which also includes developing new and advanced equipment for our response teams, as well as sustaining the equipment uh, recapitalization cycle to ensure we have gear ready to go. The site and its MNO personnel provide support to the joint FBI and NSA stabilization program and capability forward initiative, which equips regional FBI EOD teams. It's not just equip, we also train those teams with advanced diagnostic gear and counter IED uh, tools and techniques oriented to radiological or nuclear threats. MSTA partners of the site also participate in and are critical contributors to all phases of our nest response operations, including the accident response group, as I mentioned earlier, if something bad happens to our weapons, and joint technical operations team, something bad happens to someone else's weapons and we've been asked to get involved. The national laboratories and our FBI partners also sustain and exercise facilities and capabilities to forensically examine a nuclear threat device should such an event require. Underpinning many of these operations are secure worldwide communications, including the department's emergency communications network, also based out of RSL uh, Nellis. We also use the site, its experts and facilities to host unclassified international exchanges, including IAEA sponsored exchanges, so uh, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, exchanges on emergency preparedness and response. One of our signature events is an exchange of best practices at a Desert Rock Airfield for countries with aerial measuring platforms, their pilots and technicians. 
RSL personnel also uh, RSL personnel also build and loan international partners uh, specialized detection and measuring equipment to aid those allies with intrinsic capabilities to detect and disrupt nuclear threats far from our shores. As you can discern, the Nevada field office, MSTS, and the site have certainly grown far beyond just a place where underground nuclear testing used to take place. And the efforts I just mentioned are only major elements within my mission, my mission space, let alone the much larger NNSA and other agencies' activities there. The Nevada National Security Site has a bright and important future in America's national security. And open it up maybe for some questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Tilden, for that. It was a great presentation. Um, we do have some questions. I have a question of my own, if you don't mind. Um, you had mentioned how we, after September 11, 2001, with the 9-11 attacks, we grew closer with the UK, with France, and worked closely with them on um, different projects. Were there any um, relationships or um, allies that we built after 9-11, kind of unexpected allies or allies that we didn't have prior uh, in the uh, more of the Cold War era? Well, uh, I can't speak definitively to, uh, you know, to the number of international allies that our DOD colleagues have brought to the site to do things. Because as you know, if you're not entering any of our sensitive nuclear facilities out there, we have a pretty broad latitude at hosting people to do things. Um, I would, um, with the UK, we started pre 9-11 worrying about nuclear terrorism and that type of an exchange. Um, so that pre-existed 9-11 uh, by easily a, a couple of years. Um, the, the French, we took a little longer to actually build that relationship. And I think that came online in about 2008, 2009, but we were dialoguing the whole time. Um, I would suggest that my DNN colleagues could talk to you about the number of networks that they've built. They've installed uh, portal detection systems. They have equipped um, customs and border folks with detection gear. Um, they, they, along with my folks, train for kind of a, a commodity identification of what things might be illicit nuclear trade, what things might be an indicator of a nuclear threat, of a terror threat. Uh, and we have gone all over, all over the globe providing that training as well as sustaining the equipment and providing equipment to close partners. And generally speaking, you use the equipment as the medium to build the relationship. And we recognize that many of these countries, they may get a detector and they may not turn it on, right? A lot of countries are gonna turn it on, but they may need help maintaining it and we can do that. A lot of them will turn it on, maintain it, and then it still comes down to what they call us when they get the alarm. But I can tell you, if someone else gave them that equipment, they're not probably calling us. They're gonna be calling whoever they have the relationship with. So uh, we have a pretty broad network of And the IAEA and the international norms help to build that. And something does happen, phone calls, uh, things like that. So I'll, I'll pause there. That's a great answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate you going into that. And um, we'll, we'll switch over to questions in the chat. Uh, the first question commented that it was a great discussion. They thank you for that. And what are your top program priorities for the next five years? So um, some of these things, of course, you can imagine I'm going to have to be somewhat vague, but uh, let, let's just say that all of, all of government, um, both this administration and the previous administration, in, in watching the slow and inexorable march of DPRK to its nuclear capability, uh, we all now go back and say, now, what should we be doing to make sure that we are better prepared to obstruct and prevent other countries from doing that. And that's a very tough mission area, right? You're trying to, you're trying to avoid war, right? Ultimately, you could always go to war. Um, that's something we certainly, you know, I think we've done a preemptive war before, and I think we're, we'll be paying for that uh, out of our treasury for a very long time, um, not to mention the, the loss of life. Um, so those are, those are some of the big areas that's a priority, is technologies that would help us detect proliferation, detect a covert nuclear program, 
things of that sort. Um, that's definitely a priority. The next priority, of course, as I think you heard me mention, is this uh, is the capability forward, providing better equipment, uh, tools, and techniques for the distributed. Right now, I think we're at 13 cities around the country covering major uh, metropolitan areas, major uh, critical infrastructure centers, and population centers. Um, and at some point, we will be revisiting uh, with uh, the interagency about it, our, where we are now. Is that sufficient or do we need to grow that? But that is a decision well above mine. Uh, and then lastly, I will tell you right now, our priority is uh, COVID. Um, we, we were very successful at having very, very de minimis effects uh, with our response uh, cadre uh, until the, the recent month. Um, uh, it really, uh, it, we really are seeing the uptick. It's just kind of a reflection, a mirror, if you will, um, of the larger population and these hotspots. And it's not really hotspots. At one point, it was the whole country was going up. I think we're now seeing some of that begin to come down. But ultimately, our job is to uh, uh, is to make sure that our folks are, are safe. So we literally sequestered some 30 people, 40, I think 35 or 40 people, and told them don't go to work. And when you're home, you need to be ultra diligent at maintaining your your distance and uh, all that from potential vectors because ultimately you're the people that we're keeping aside in case the other ones who are continuing to go to work and continuing to do things our mission if we all of a sudden got hit got clobbered with uh, covid we would have to have a team ready to go and we've managed to do that even with the increase in numbers here in the last so that's been I think the last thing, which is all of government, which is I think all of us here on this line right now, is truly trying to understand. So now that we've destigmatized telework, is truly trying to understand uh, for the unclass work that we can do, um, how do we rethink what it looks like to be in a distributed office? What does it look like to have some percentage of folks working three, four days a week at home? They come in when they need to. Some of the folks who need to get access to the classified systems and things that's what they're in more often uh, so i think we're still genuinely going through that thought process now we know that as a larger agency there are huge tranches of our workforce that just simply don't have that option that ultimately the maintenance of the nuclear deterrent requires tools and hands it requires people in the labs it requires people in the sites we have construction projects that are continuing uh, and i think we've been learning a lot of lessons and i think we've been doing really quite well at uh, trying to minimize any sort of workplace transmission. The vast majority of the COVID cases that we've had in the department are community-based. It's what we're doing in our stores. It's what we're doing at home. It's our family gatherings, all that. I'll pause there. Thank you, Mr. Chilton, for giving us that peek behind the curtain. It's always interesting to see how government agencies are working in dealing with the COVID issue. So thank you for that. Uh, we have another one who commented on and thanking you for your presentation. Um, they ask, how can an NSA help make the site more useful and available uh, for our USG and international partners? So that is a really good question. I, I think we've actually done a pretty good job of that. Um, uh, international partners, I think uh, some of the issues would be which international partners that we have. So again, when you're talking about preventing the spread of nuclear technology, now, um, have a very, very large emergency preparedness and response. I would suggest that some of those countries, we still probably wouldn't want to necessarily invite onto uh, the site to do types of work in close proximity to what is still some very na sensitive national security missions. So, um, so some of this really is the fact that I think, as I mentioned uh, in the talk, um, uh, you know, this is still a national security proving ground. Um, and it is it is truly, and I recognize, we all know the world's getting smaller, right? We all know that the geospatial means, even commercial, we, we know all that stuff. It's all, you know, let alone the cyber and all that. But, but the site's unique piece is in fact that we can actually have a high confidence to mitigate those kinds of collection um, and be able to do things that we need to do. So as one could argue, there are, there are the there are nuclear allies, there are the NATO allies, there's the next tier down on the combating terrorism allies. You know, the further down that you go, I think 
some of these tend to drop off just because of the, the, the relative risks, if you will, that you have to weigh about who you're going to invite onto the site and its adjacent areas. Um, so I, I actually am, I don't believe that the site is actually, um, is actually desperate for some sort of international marketing thing. Uh, I think right now, some of the concerns, again, my opinion, I am not a site manager. In fact, we may even have Dave Bowman on the call here, who is the field office manager at Nevada and a good colleague and friend. You know, I think some of the challenges really are is how are they going to make sure that they have the infrastructure, the personnel, and all that fun stuff for the current missions that are already lined up. I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Mr. Children. Um, we, um, we also have another question. So for those listening today who are interested in a career helping with the critical missions, are there current opportunities? Uh, how can they find out about them? And I'd also like to add the question to this. Um, what are some great resources for people who want to learn more about the department, the agency, or just the mission of an NSA as a whole? So we have a, a pretty reasonable website, but you know, websites do tend to be, uh, you know, they are what they are, right? Um, I, I believe, um, I know that this year, sadly, this year, uh, the previous administrator had some very interesting plans for celebrating the 20th anniversary of NNSA. Uh, and it was going to be sponsored with the Smithsonian and there were really, and I don't know what sort of gathering of data and documents and all that that happened, but COVID really run that off, really ran that off the rails, unfortunately. Um, so, but there are plenty of books to read about the mission uh, and to read about slices of the mission that will, uh, there's plenty of atomic testing books. Um, there's plenty of, of really fantastic books about proliferation. Um, and in that you'll get the snippets of all these kinds of things, you know, the dead hand, this discussion of what do you do at the end of uh, at the end of the Cold War. Um, let's see, there's also uh, uh, in, in uh, Command and Control, there is, um, uh, that was a great book that, uh, you know, it's not all perfect, right? But it's a pretty reasonable write up and a contour of the, of the tensions between the military side, wanting to ensure that the weapons were available for use against the design side, who was like worried that we could do better and some of these designs ought to be modified to be more safe. Uh, and that, that, that tension just will always be. It'll be with every country that decides to field a nuclear weapon. Um, so command and control is a good one. Um, there's One Point Safe. That's kind of an interesting uh, story. So there's a lot of books out there that talk about that. So that's one piece of the mission space. I don't know if anyone's written a, a book about the NSA. Uh, I have to say that's not on my list of things to do. Um, uh, but I'm sure that the, the, the historian and the public affairs folks, you know, could certainly help with some of that. Um, and as for uh, jobs, as for uh, getting, a, getting a position, uh, MSTS, I think, is, uh, has periodically been really uh, opened at hiring. And they hire, like any large company, you're going to hire everything. You need, you need folks who can fix bridges. You need folks who can do facilities. You need folks who can do uh, personnel uh, budgeting, finance, as well as work in tunnels, mining. Um, so, uh, and then if you want to look on the federal side, um, you know, we do USA jobs and I believe NSA just had, I think three or four virtual job fairs through the COVID piece. Uh, now I'll, I will admit that most of those jobs tend to be in DC. We're trying to really think more creatively about not being so centralized. We do have large operating locations in Albuquerque. And then of course we have our major field offices and sites. So um, one of my colleagues really giving me a bunch of guff about that, but we have the Savannah River site. Uh, we have uh, headquarters in DC and Germantown as two big facilities. Uh, moving to the West, we have Y-12. Uh, we have Y-12 in uh, Tennessee and then continue to move. We then have Kansas City and Missouri, uh, which is a, a production facility for non-nuclear components. Uh, very fascinating uh, infrastructure there, very fascinating mission. Uh, Y-12 is a direct nuclear mission um, for uh, largely HU-related things, highly enriched uranium. Um, if you keep going, uh, we then hit uh, uh, Amarillo, um, which is a uh, Pantex. That is the uh, location where we assemble, disassemble, and maintain nuclear weapons, all the nuclear weapons. Um, they cycle through there on a periodic uh, basis. Uh, then you get 
get to uh, New Mexico, which is the home of two of our major labs, uh, San Diego National Laboratories and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and we also have a, uh, a field office there, San Diego field office, as well as the complex. There's a, um, the complex, which is largely a, a hub of a lot of people who work for multiple program offices. And we also have a Los Alamos field office. And then moving further to the west, you then get to uh, get to Nevada. Um, and in Nevada, as you know, is the RSL and the MSTS, as well as the field office there. And then you have STL, which does a really lot of great spooky things out in uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, and then, of course, you get far to the west coast and you get to Lawrence Livermore and the Livermore field office there, again, a major design and physics lab. Um, and so the point here is all of those entities are hiring. In fact, we have done a phenomenal job. Luckily, there are less people like me now, bald, old, bald, white men, right? We are doing a phenomenal job of hiring young folks, mid-careerists. Uh, we have plenty of opportunities. We have some, I mean, I even have some folks overseas. We have an LNO assigned at UConn and Stuttgart. Uh, although it's not technically overseas, it's still over half the sea. And we have a, an LNO in Indopaycom. Uh, and these folks are there to, to help advise uh, those commands about things that relate to nuclear problems. Uh, and they reach back to the whole department. And then the department at large also has overseas uh, stations, uh, overseas LNOs, uh, they call them energy attaches at I, I think some 23 locations around the country. So if you're interested, uh, you just gotta start looking. It's there and you can always reach out to, uh, you can even start by reaching out through the web pages. start with the public affairs and they can steer you to the USA jobs and things of that sort. So how about if I pause on that? Well, thank you for, for pointing everybody in, in the conversation. And also this is gonna go on YouTube. So we appreciate you pointing everybody into the, uh, you know, great suggestions, pointing them that direction. Uh, Jonathan with the um, NSA Public Affairs also mentioned that they will be having a enterprise-wide job fair on January 27th, 2021. Uh, that will be virtual. Um, so on the website, the NSA website, you'll be able to find out more information about that. And uh, one of the, the things that I want to um, mention as well, one of the questions I should say that I, that I was going to ask you is in terms of education. Um, as we know here at the museum, one of the things that, that we encounter a lot is there's a lot of the misinformation, a lot of, you know, misconceptions about nuclear and about the site itself and an NSA as a whole. Do you find yourself in your position, is a lot of it trying to explain really more in the, the core of what you really do and have to dispel a lot of those myths of what the NSA does? Or is it uh, pretty pretty clear for most of the politicians and people in other areas? Okay, so that was about a lot there, Joseph. Let me uh, try to let me try to piece it out here. So let's start with um, Let's start with DC based politicians. It's like a layer of the onion. There are those who are very much, uh, you know, very aware of what we do, the ones that are on the uh, authorization committees and the appropriations committees. Most of them and their staffs uh, are very familiar with the mission. And there's not really a lot of, uh, of myth busting that needs to happen. There is genuinely some disagreements about mission space and how to get there. We have benefited. We have benefited. Uh, so the, the increase in the overall nuclear deterrent budget started. Uh, midway, maybe even earlier than midway through Obama, we have enjoyed bipartisan with everything we're doing. Uh, but I think uh, the point to take away here is that the nuclear deterrent is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and until other countries decide to change behaviors and do things differently, uh, it's even become a bit more important, sadly. Um, so that's for the first piece. Now, now you start moving away and you start getting out into the larger. Now there are there certainly are folks on the Hill who just don't come involved with this. And so sometimes an errant thing will come up and they really don't understand what's going on. And to be honest, uh, we as a nation aren't terribly uh, nuclear educated. Um, we didn't like it. We didn't like China syndrome, that old movie with um, Jane Fonda or Harry Fonda, I can't remember what it was, Henry Fonda. Uh, we certainly, and that I think that movie came out within months of Three Mile Island happening, which was again, uh, just a minor release, but it was still a, a major operational error and a major uh, accident. So we've, you know, and then you add Chernobyl and then you add Fukushima and uh, a lot of the world has soured 
on nuclear power. And then that just makes everything nuclear. And as I mentioned before in the past, um, you know, uh, I, I wasn't there that, I mean, I know I, people joke, they think I've been around forever and that's true. I'm only 3000 years old, but I wasn't in that business back then. I genuinely don't understand how it is. It was so hard for then the, the, the Department of Defense to keep records about uh, the veterans who were told to go out and stand. I mean, this was, this was, was the scary Cold War days. They were making decisions that they had to make about how to understand this stuff. But, you know, that whole piece, uh, it does kind of make you kind of wonder, you know, those things, when you see that, and then the trouble that the government had to go through to finally get the funds set up and to go track these people down and make sure they're taken care of, which they've done lots of mitigative programs for this. Same with the downwinders, the folks who are outside of Hanford, outside of Nevada, that might have been in the way of the material releases and things of that sort. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, they've done the best they can on that. But those things sour the, the public perception. So if you don't really understand something, and then you have to read uh, what was the book I just read that talked about how impactful the day after was on, the pres on President Reagan. And that's literally why he went into negotiations and he was ready to just say, hey, you know, Mikhail, you and I, let's just abolish all nuclear weapons between our two countries. You know, they were, they were that close. Um, you know, those kinds of things, they stick with people. If you don't understand something, it's scary, right? Um, we, we regularly get phone calls in from people. Sadly, some of them, you wonder if maybe they have other issues going on, but they, and they think they've been exposed or they think someone's trying to poison them. And what you later find is that actually, you know, they have other things going on, but there also are genuine, they're genuine concerns. So I think uh, we saw um, some recent discussions about it was a, a school, a school in Ohio that they had found some detectable limits of, of, of nuclear material, probably attributed to um, the, a, a legacy site. And this is another thing that I think people don't understand is that just because we can detect it doesn't mean it's dangerous. We can detect, we can detect radioactivity in a lot of things, right? Granite. Uh, if you live in a brick home, uh, if you fly, if you fly above twenty thousand feet, I mean, the, you're getting dose. Dose is just all around us. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, what happens is people don't understand. And as you know, um, risk acceptance is very personal. And it also tends to be very, it can be very uh, biased by your view. So a person will be absolutely livid that they live near a nuclear power plant and they think that they might get a, a dose of some type. And then they're gonna, as they're, as they're yelling at you or talking about it, they're gonna pull out a cigarette and they're gonna take a puff. All right, well, I can tell you, you know, uh, the latter thing is certainly much more damaging than the thing you're worried about, the perceived risk. But this is something that, you know, is more, it's more custom. It's more, it's, well, you know, a lot of people smoke. Um, so this is a really important, this idea of attempting to educate, and this is part of what we spend a lot of time doing in our emergency preparedness and response with our state and locals. Uh, and, and I'm gonna jump to another topic in a couple of seconds, which is why we do it. But we do this because the messaging is really important that you really need to be ready to be frank and honest with the public if something happens. So in these cases, I'm gonna to jump to this, it's, it's the use of nuclear materials in medicine. So nuclear materials save lives every day, right? These radiological sources uh, that are put in blood irradiators, they're put in food irradiators, they're in, they're in ke chemotherapy treatment type things, um, that is saving lives and you have to handle it carefully and you have to make sure it's secure that way no one does something you know, accidental or deliberate um, so those things are very real and people can accept it when it's in that, in, in, you know, when it's couched that way, but they do get very nervous about, well, you know, what's that nuclear site out there and you guys, what are y'all doing? You know, uh, I think most people don't understand how different government regulatory processes are, are now compared to what they were during the deep dark days in the fifties and early sixties in the cold war. They were very different then, right? Uh, that is not where we are today. We monitor all of our sites. Uh, I think we do an excellent job of, and, and by the way, it's important because uh, we're, we're not, you know, we're not drafting people to be forced to work at these locations. We are attracting people to work there and we want the smartest people. We want best, brightest, uh, you know, they got to get through the clearance process. Most of them, I mean, it's hard and you got to get them in and you know what you want? You want to keep them safe and you want to keep them happy. 
So uh, yeah, this is always going to be a problem as long as uh, as long as our schools continue to uh, minimize, if you will, I think STEM, right? Of which that exposes you to the understanding of naturally occurring radiation and other things. Um, as long as uh, we continue to be deficient as a country on this, we're just always going to have that barrier to get through. Thank you so much for peeling back that question. I appreciate it. I know there was a lot out in that, so I appreciate you looking into it. I appreciate that. Um, we do have one last question. It's a, it's a larger question, maybe a bit technical, but I do want to ask it. Um, so a person in chat is asking, so isotope separation is the core of proliferation um, of nuclear material. Uh, now, currently it takes a, a ma massive technical effort. Um, are there, is there any research being done into how it can be, how isotope separation can be done more simply than it is right now? And that's the big question they're asking. So um, yes, first off, uh, isotope separation, right? Centrifuges, things of that sort. All, th that is all old technology. And if a country goes down that route, uh, it is it is a big footprint. You can't just, you know, you, it's hard to hide it. I think we've, we've seen a certain country right now who is, uh, that they got caught by their own insider kind of whistleblower groups. Iran, just to be clear. Um, so um, first off, I will just suggest that uh, uh, one of the real challenges we face, I'm going to put centrifuge aside and I'm going to expand this to the larger issue, is we, uh, and I believe we're doing a very good job of it, but I want to say also that I don't want to get into groupthink and keep slapping myself on the back and saying, oh, we got this, we got this. Ultimately, one of the big challenges of our non-proliferation and counter-proliferation missions is to understand that how we achieved the bomb and how China and Russia, sorry, how Russia next and then China next achieved the bomb along with France and UK will not be how they do it this time. So another country coming along has different technology choices. And in fact, one of our challenges is in fact to keep up with. So we know that the, the undeniable piece there that must be addressed is I must obtain nuclear material refined in such a way that I can use it in a bomb. So that's, that's the piece that is known. If you don't have that, you're just not in the game. Um, so ultimately the issue here is besides the fact that you need the reactor, right? Um, uh, for plutonium or you need centrifuges for the uranium um, or something like that. The catch is what are those new technologies? So the catch is how small of a reactor could you have? And what, what unusual ways could you go? How small of a reprocessing footprint could it be? Um, Instead of centrifuges, what are the new technologies? What are the other things you could do um, that could maybe be harder? So uh, my colleagues in uh, defense nuclear nonproliferation R&D, along with some of my folks in the basement uh, of the Forstall building, uh, along with, to be honest, a, a large number of the members of the ICT, attempt to keep ahead of this. We attempt to, to understand where technology surprise may come and how it could be applied. And nuclear is a very narrow world right now, right? I mean, so there's the broader issue. I mean, there's the, bi I mean, bio is a, is a real challenge, right? Because ultimately chem and bio both have very, very large conventional civil uses, so dual uses. Whereas nuclear has some dual use, but the nuclear is pretty narrow, right? It's either nuclear medicine or it's nuclear power uh, or it's gonna be a nuclear bomb. I mean, there's, you know, there's not a whole lot in between there. Um, so, um, when you come into bio, right, the things that look great for developing all manner of, you know, all manner of new drugs, all manner of everything, uh, very quickly, depending on how you look at that optic. So th the speed of technology will remain forever a challenge for all of us, it always has been. In fact, just to remind everyone, it was a bunch of academics who came to the US government and wrote a letter to the president saying, I think this is a viable weapon. It didn't start inside the, it didn't start inside uh, the government. It started inside academia. And so that's something that we have to do. And that's something I think we have a real challenge with our country in the future. We are really torn between getting the best and brightest in across the world to come to our universities, to keep our universities competitive and on the top. And at the same time, making sure that we're not accidentally allowing all this intellectual property and things that are popping out of these centers to get back to other countries. We're really, conflicted on this and we should be conflicted because it's not easy 
Um, so that that is just yeah. And you know, for two seconds about technology, and then I'll stop. Right now, I guarantee you, while we continue and we must continue to uh, to make sure that our nuclear deterrent is not only maintained but is second to none and all that. So we're going to continue to spend. And by the way, DoD is spending pretty big sums as well to make sure that the platforms are ready to go, uh, new subs, new bombers, etc. Uh, until that game, can, you know, no longer gets played, you got to play the game. But what I will suggest to you, and this is this takes away from nothing of what I just said, is that as I mentioned before, nuclear weapons are a a sixty plus year old uh, um, uh, technology. We yeah, we've optimized it, but it's really sixty plus years old, uh, seventy now, I guess. And um, we should be asking ourselves, what is the revolution in military affairs? What is the thing? right that that comes along and there's always been something to come along the aircraft carrier and the aircraft sunk the battleship right the, the sub was certainly a dynamic there on ground you know on ground it started with the cannon and the musket and it moves on next thing you got the tank and then the tank and the aircraft and and it's really interesting to watch how many times countries miss uh what thing became more important right um, and so this is something that again keeping a strong academic and scientific in our civil sectors, as well as in our government-related RDT&E, is absolutely critical to make sure that we aren't caught flat-footed. Um, and you know, we're definitely in very interesting times, sadly. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for answering that question. And thank you so much again for your wonderful talk, Mr. Tilden. And thank you to everyone who joined us virtually today. On behalf of the National Atomic Testing Museum and the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation, I want to wish you all a healthy and happy holidays and thank you again for joining us. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate it and Merry Christmas. <laughs>